Hi friends, I hope this finds you well. Um, I wanted to do a video today and share some thoughts <clears throat> about the gospel and the city of Jerusalem. We're talking about the city of Jerusalem in the Middle East. And, but, but kind of begs the question, what on earth does the gospel have to do with Jerusalem? And <clears throat> I, I'd like to study a few passages with you. So we'll, we'll be jumping into a bunch of passages briefly because I'd like to explain why, like you read certain passages in the Bible, like one that stands out to me often is Psalm 137, five. Uh, verses five and six, and the psalmist says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. That's pretty, that sounds like it's pretty intense and important. You know, granted, maybe he could just be, <clears throat> he's in Babylon at the time, so maybe he's just saying, I want to go home real bad. <clears throat> or, but other passages like Jesus' lament in Matthew 23, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. And the, the, the big lament about what's going to happen, probably referencing AD 70, but, he's, but he finishes with, but you will see me again when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And <clears throat> another passage that stands out is Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that's burning. It sounds like the, the significance of Jerusalem is way more than we often give it credit for. And so <clears throat> some of you might say, sure, it's important, but it's an important side point. And my, what I want to bring up is that maybe it's not a side point. Maybe history has relegated it to a side point. Um, <clears throat> one thing I like to keep in mind is that Christian theology... So <clears throat> the theology of a separate group that had formerly decided that they weren't going to be a part of the Jewish community, <clears throat> the Jewish community could be a part of their group, but they weren't going to be a part of the Jewish community. That group formed a body of ideas that they eventually deemed as orthodox and kind of a standard of truth. Remember, those things weren't arranged and those conversations didn't happen until after the destruction of the temple in AD 70. So a lot of Christian theology, if not all of Christian theology, was built around the assumption that there is no temple and the city of Jerusalem is essentially irrelevant to the plan of redemption. So <clears throat> I want to jump back before that and, and look and see if we have some evidence that maybe the city of Jerusalem held a more important and significant part of the gospel itself for early disciples of Jesus and for uh, Jews of that time period. <clears throat> so just imagine a time if hearing the word the gospel actually evoked ideas related to the city of Jerusalem. I know that sounds really odd in our day, but there was a time when that was the case. So, for example, the word that's used in the New Testament for gospel, yongelion, is actually, a, it's a secular word, right? And it's, it's mostly used in a secular context. It just means good news. It could mean good news of somebody traveling back from the front lines of a war to tell them that the, you know, the city that, that they had warded off the enemy and they were safe. <clears throat> that was a good use of the word good news. There was also a preacher of good news or somebody preaching the good news. And, and they used the word in that situation, not just for the message, which is yongelion in Greek, but yongelizo or yongelizomai. In, in, in the Septuagint Greek, it uses the word yongelizomai. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And it was familiar to all the writers of the New Testament. They frequently, when they cite, if you've ever read in the Bible, and they say, just like Isaiah said, <clears throat> and you go back and you go, 
Well, that's kind of a loose reading of what Isaiah said. A lot of times it's because they're quoting from the Septuagint, from the Greek translation. It was very prominent at the time. So <clears throat> an, Isaiah, uh, an example would be Isaiah 40, verses 9 and 10, where <clears throat> the, the psalmist says, Get up, um, you who... Hold on, I'm actually going to bring that up. I forgot to bring it up just now. <clears throat> Get yourself up on a high mountain, you bearer of good news to Zion. Lift up your voice mightily, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And so the, the word there is you who bring the gospel or share the gospel to Jerusalem, tell them your God reigns or your God will come. Interesting, eh? <clears throat> now let's look at Isaiah 52, starting in verse 7. This is also another familiar passage, starting in verse 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation, and says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. They shout joyfully together, for they will see with their own eyes when the Lord restores Zion. Break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, and he's redeemed Jerusalem. He, the Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations." And all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. This is another example. Another one is Isaiah 61, which is a well-known passage that Jesus quotes um, when he reads in the synagogue in Luke 4. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news. And disconnected from the Septuagint reading of Isaiah, and disconnected from the context in general of Isaiah, we see that there was a message in verse 40 called Good News, the Gospel to Jerusalem, and another one in, in chapter 52 of Isaiah that talks about someone who will come to Jerusalem and share that good news, presumably announcing good news before it actually happens. And then you see the same thing in Isaiah 61, where he's preaching the good news of a coming redemption. And so... Why on earth would this have so much to do with the city of Jerusalem? Why would the word gospel be so tied up and intertwined with the city of Jerusalem? Well, one, remember, again, even if we've forgotten about it, even in, in, the, in the Zionist Christian community, generally Jerusalem is thought of as a side point, as a side element of the gospel. It just proves that God still loves the Jews and he still has a, the Abrahamic covenant is still in place with them. And, but that's not what I think is, is, is being talked about here. The good news to Zion way exceeds what happened in 1948 and the reestablishment of the city of Jerusalem and of the nation of Israel. So <clears throat> I want to remind everyone, Jerusalem very clearly throughout the Tanakh and, and in the New Testament, if you know how to read the, the, the passages about Jerusalem in a straightforward way instead of spiritualizing them, you'll realize that the, the city of Jerusalem is the epicenter of global redemption in the world to come, right? This is where the Messiah will rule from. <clears throat> Think of passages like Isaiah 8, Verses 2 and 2 and 3 come to mind. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very zealous or jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and I will dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. The mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. And it also evokes, too, like just in passing how Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, don't swear by the city of Jerusalem because that's the city of the great king. The city of the great king. It's assumed that that will be the city where the king rules from. Um, also, 1 Kings 
1 Kings 11, he reiterates a, a phrase really common from the Tanakh, that there would be, or from the Torah, where the Torah anticipates a city where God would cause his name to dwell. And he clarifies, um, my servant David will have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen for myself to put my name. So God has chosen Jerusalem specifically to have his name dwell there forever. I just read Zechariah 8. Go on a little forward into Zechariah 8. So Zechariah 8 begins in verses 2 and 3, like I just read, with the anticipation that God would dwell in Jerusalem and Jerusalem would be known as the faithful city. And, um, and, and, this, and the mountain of the Lord would be called the holy mountain. But look a little bit further. It actually shows the trajectory of why. Zechariah 8, starting in verse 20. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many people and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, Let us go at once to entreat the Lord and ask the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many people and powerful nations, powerful nations, guys, will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. So it's not just that he will dwell there. He will dwell there and the nations will come and seek him there. This is the future of the city of Jerusalem. It also reminds us of Isaiah 2 or Micah 4. In Micah 4 verses 1 through 3, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord, which is, which is Mount Zion, right? Uh, just outside of Jerusalem, sometimes synonymous with the city of Jerusalem. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many people and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Once again, the mighty nations there. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Amen. Never again will they train for war. This will be the fruit of when God redeems Jerusalem, comes to dwell there, and the nations go to seek him there. <clears throat> I think if we have this in mind and we realize, like Paul said, what, what God has done in, in, in Romans 11, he acknowledges what God is doing among the, the Gentiles is amazing. But just imagine what happens when the redemption of Israel happens. When they all... Like, he, like uh, the Messiah said in, in uh, Matthew 23, you'll see me again when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is quoting from Psalm 118. He said, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And that's for the planet. That's for every family of the earth. It'll be life from the dead. That's what's going to happen when the city of Jerusalem is redeemed and the people of Israel see the one that they pierced. And <clears throat> what I just want to say is I want to bring up, I, I want to I say with the psalmist, I want to say, oh, if I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill. Because <clears throat> we, we definitely have a tendency to see God's redemption as so individual, especially in the West, but really, this has been exported all across the globe, that God's redemption is so individual and it so centers on the next 70 or 80 years of my puny little life that things like the city of Jerusalem and this grand narrative about the redemption of all of the earth, they seem irrelevant. It seems like a side topic. But just the fact that they were using the same language that Isaiah the prophet used when he, when he was talking about announcing to Jerusalem, don't worry, your God will come. He is going to redeem you and do all that he said. I think that if we want to go back and find out what they envisioned with this gospel proclamation, 
it's going to be a lot more geographical than we're probably comfortable with. It's going to involve that city, and it's going to involve the proclamation that the Creator, that Yahweh, that the Almighty God is going to live in that city. And His Messiah will dwell there. And it is going to produce peace and lasting joy for all the nations. And so I want to do this to, to um, I actually had this stirred this morning because I was uh, praying and, and I have a little prayer calendar and I, <clears throat> and I have on there because I write my calendar based on what I, what I value, what I want to care about. You know, I think it's important and I don't necessarily care about it every day. And so I wrote down today, I'm literally praying for the redemption of Jerusalem. It's one of the, one of the things on, on this day. And I thought to myself, oh, I don't like that I don't feel that right now. I don't like it. And so I said, man, I want to feel like the psalmist if I forget her. If I forget Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. And, and so I just want to encourage you guys. I, I mentioned Isaiah 62 earlier. And... <clears throat> It reminds me also of uh, Isaiah 62, a little bit further in verse 6. The Lord says, again, with all this grand narrative and how crucial the role of, of, of uh, the, the redemption of Jerusalem is in the gospel narrative. It's not a side part of the story. It's a central part of the story. And uh, Isaiah 62, verse, starting in verse 6, he says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I've appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourself and give him no rest till he makes, till he establishes and makes Jerusalem the praise of the whole earth or a praise on the earth. And I want to have, I want to have that heart in me that my heart is just ready to cling to that hope of the redemption of Jerusalem. And so I want to stir you guys and to just say the city of Jerusalem has much more to do with the gospel than just the mini, the, the micro-narrative of what God is doing in your life, which is awesome. But you place what God's doing in your life in context to this timeline and where all of the families of the earth are going to be redeemed once the Lord dwells in that place where he's caused his name to dwell forever. That's incredible. It's incredible to think about. It's incredible to pray about. It's incredible to anchor our hope in that. And so that's that's the reason for the video. I want to stir you guys up to uh, have your hope in this, to remind the Lord of this. And um, yeah, so anyways, guys, Lord be with you. I pray this is edifying and that your faith is stirred and it more and more, more than give you good theology, that more and more, this equips you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus all the more today. More today than you did yesterday. So amen, guys. The Lord be with you, and uh, look forward to connecting next time. Shalom.